Hi, this is uh, Jacob Kirsch from the Cleveland Clinic in Florida. We're going to discuss the calcium scoring on standard chest CT examinations, applying some of the evidence. I have no relevant financial disclosures at this time. So why don't we start with what we know? Just a brief overview of what we currently have known based on the literature for past years. And this is data from the American Heart Association published in 2015, but it's based on a 2011 U.S. mortality study. And it is estimated that approximately one of every three deaths in the U.S. is related to cardiovascular disease. On average, that would be an estimate of just over 2,150 Americans dying of cardiovascular disease each day, which averages to about one death every 40 seconds. So some assumptions that can be made out of the more in-depth data published by the American Heart Association is that if all forms of cardiovascular disease could be eliminated, life expectancy in the U.S. could rise by almost seven years. We can compare that with all forms of cancer being eliminated, which would only rise the estimated life expectancy by approximately three years. Having said that, this doesn't take into account years of, mor of morbidity, productivity, or cost involved with treatment. So a bit of history on calcium scoring, and we can go back a few centuries into the Renaissance era, which when some European pathologists had already noticed that calcifications of the coronary arterial system correlated pretty well with death from heart disease. But it wasn't until many, many years later in the 1960s and 1970s when the first peer-reviewed publication with scientific data proving that coronary calcification on fluoroscopy was found to correlate with obstructive coronary disease uh, was made. And this also correlated with adverse coronary outcomes. To have a, another historical perspective, the first coronary angiography was performed by Dr. Mason Sons in 1958. So just a short two years later, the first data making this correlation was made available in the literature. In the early 1980, uh, Margolis and colleagues, they described their experience in a five-year survival rate for patients uh, with fluoroscopically detected coronary calcification, and this was also independent of other risk factors. However, there were several limitations on this study, as they had a limited ability to demonstrate small plaques, and also it was very operator dependent, and of course there were other overlapping structures on fluoroscopy that made this very difficult to assess sometimes. In 1990, Arthur Agaston and Warren Janowitz published their landmark paper on coronary artery calcification, where they described their, their process for an actual formal quantification of coronary artery calcium burden using gated, unenhanced CT examinations of the heart. And they shown that this was a, a good non-invasive technique for identifying clinical and subclinical coronary atherosclerosis. And again, this was a very elegant and simple way of giving an assessment of how much calcified plaque was in the coronary arterial tree. However, they did not have a gold standard or any type of histopathological correlation to prove their findings. But since then, it is estimated that more than 2,500 papers in the peer-reviewed literature has been published uh, showing the formal quantification of this calcium in the coronary arteries is associated with the overall plaque burden and also to some extent the probability of significant coronary artery stenosis. So we have come quite a way since that very first paper from 1990. And this is summarizes uh, some of those findings from a clinical point of view. So this is a receiver operating curve uh, showing different risk stratifiers. It shows how coronary artery calcium has consistently been associated to, with an increase in the area under the curve than other combined risk factors. Now for a risk factor, when you're looking at odds ratio to have some clinical utility, it has to be estimated to be at least four or greater. So we see here that intimal medial thickness and frank Frangima a risk score is at four, but look at coronary artery calcium. It reaches a grade of 11, so definitely a very strong predictor. So how would, do we do it? So the formal quantification, the Agatstone scoring, is done on a non-contrast limited chest CT scan. It's done using ECG gating to try and maintain the heart as static as possible during imaging. The presence of calcium is assessed in the entire epicardial coronary system. And the way the software analyzes this data, it, it looks for pixels with a threshold of at least 130 Hounsfield units per pixel with an area of at least three or more adjacent pixels. This more or less is equivalent with a one millimeter square of arterial wall. Once this uh, data is gathered, there are three different ways to score it. The Agatstone score being the standard that is 
used the most uh, commonly in the clinical practice and the literature. So coronary artery calcium indicates that there's at least there is some atherosclerotic plaque present. It's defined by any score over zero. It is clinically significant and it's an indication for risk factor management. There's enough data in the literature, mostly from the MESA trial, that you can correlate the score on your patients by comparing them to the quartiles matched by age and sex gender on this research data. Usually a score greater than 400 is an indication for further diagnostic evaluation, such as a stress testing, exercise stress testing, perfusion imaging. Now, do we really need to have a formal quantification? CHESCT offers an opportunity for detection of unsuspected or maybe suspected cardiovascular disease. This became very evident in the National Lung Screening Trial, which was released just a few years ago, ever since some papers have been starting to show in the literature. Interestingly, the patients that fulfill the criteria to be included in the National Lung Screening Trial are patients that are at least intermediate risk for cardiac events. Not only that, when we look at the results from the trial, cardiovascular illness was the number one cause for death rather than lung cancer. So going back in the literature, back to 2006, this is probably the first publication trying to measure coronary artery calcifications in non-gated, low-dose CT images of the chest. And what the authors found in this uh, study of over 4,200 participants was that there was a correlation of coronary artery calcium prevalence with pack years of smoking, and also it was more prevalent in males than females. However, they also noticed that once you reach the age of 50 years, that difference between females and males started to be less. And all of these findings correlated very well with what we knew of atherosclerotic calcified plaque burden based on earlier electronic beam, um, electron beam CT examinations. In this, in this paper, comparing ECG-gated conventional calcium scoring with low-dose ungated uh, multi-detector CT, we can see also if we just analyze for the absence or presence of calcified coronary plaque, there's really good correlation with only a handful of studies being placed in the wrong category for both of service in this case. From the same study, then here we see that when we try to ca categorize them in the buckets as non-mild, moderate, and severe burden of calcium score, also the correlation is really, really good with some minimal or a handful of studies of patients being placed in the wrong risk category. This is a study that we published in 2012 where we created an ordinal calcium score based on visual assessment, purely on visual assessment, and correlated that with conventional Agatstone calcium scoring. We showed that there was a very strong correlation, not only for total, but also per vessel. On our study, we also were able to show a very high intra and intra-observer variability. Important to notice that the absence of calcium on the standard CT examination also was associated with a very low coronary artery calcium score, the mean Agatstone score being 0 0.5. This is another similar study comparing Agatstone calcium score with a visual scoring on standard chest CTs in approximately 500 patients showed a very good area under the curve with an R value of approximately 0 0.82. So again, very good correlation between both types of studies for determining the cause and burden. This um, study from 2010 also showed really good agreement between visually estimated calcium artery score and a standard Agatstone score. We can tell from this table that probably the hardest category to really risk stratify or place our patients in when doing a visual score is in the minimal amount of calcium, those with a Agatstone score of one to nine. Otherwise, we seem to do a pretty good job. And this study as well showed the high degree of inter-observer reproducibility of those visually obtained scores. A few images as examples is a patient that was deemed to have a mild amount of coronary calcified plaque burden. Here we see a small plaque in the RCA. On the left of the screen is an ECG-gated standard scoring exam. On the right of the screen, a non-gated multi-detector CT exam of the chest. This is a patient with a moderate amount of plaque here in the proximal LAD. And we have a patient in the mid LAD, a densely calcified plaque shown again in both type of examinations, correlating pretty well. So is this type of measuring reproducible? The study published in 2010 shows when repeated the score at a second MDCT, again, we were able to put the patients in the bucket in three out of four cases with only minimal shift to the adjacent 
risk group. Of the 584 cases analyzed, a shift of more than one category was found in only eight participants, which represented 1.4% of the total. So again, pretty good correlation. The same study, here we're showing the 49 uh, patients that had a CASM score of zero in one of the MDCT exams and a positive score or greater than zero on the second MDCT examination or vice versa. It could have been positive on the first one and zero on the follow-up. However, this is to show that of those that had a discordant finding, 71% of them had a score on the positive study of less than 10. So again, minimal calcific burden, if any. So we've seen that it correlates very well, both studies. Um, but what about outcomes data? What do we know so far based on the published evidence? This is a very nice paper from um, Shechem and colleagues coming out of Israel with over 8,700 uh, patients, all smokers, with an age in the range of 40 to 85, they developed an ordinal scoring system where they would score patients, and patients with a 4 or greater score were deemed to have a significant amount of calcified plaque. So here they're plotted in the Cox proportional hazard ratios, the red line representing those with a high score of calcium, or over 4 in their system, and the blue line representing those with less than that. And you can see that there is a statistically significant difference. They have follow-ups of up to over seven years and definitely giving us some good outcome data for cardiac-related adverse events. So moderate and large amounts of coronary artery calcium were highly associated with a significant increase in cardiovascular death in this study. Now, this is a very important paper published just a few months ago this year by Childs and colleagues using a subgroup of the participants of the National Lung Screening Trial, just over 1,500 of them, Images were reviewed by five cardiothoracic radiologists, and they divided the patients, or they were included the patients based on three groups. They had patients with deaths related to coronary heart disease, patients who died related to other causes, and persons, patients that were still alive at the end of the trial. And importantly, they used three different scoring methods to assess them. The first one using a purely visual subjective assessment, non, mild, moderate, and severe. The second one using an ordinal assessment that they developed for the project. And the third one putting the studies through the post-processing software to obtain an Agatstone score per se. If we look at this table, which summarizes their findings, the association between their calcium score and the time to coronary heart disease death from all three methods is as follows. All of those um, boxed areas. Now, if we look at the first grouping of lines, those are with patients deemed to have a scoring of zero or non, no calcified plaque. Then the second grouping of rows is for those with mild, then moderate, and of course the one at the bottom is gonna be with severe. But what's important is, is if we look at the hazard ratios in, this, in these models, either univariate or multivariate, is that as the calcium score category increased, so did the hazard ratio. And this was true for all type of scoring methods. Not only that, same population also showed there was an association between coronary artery calcium and the time to all-cause mortality. And that was again seen in all three of scoring methods. The simplest method, an overall visual assessment of coronary artery calcium as non-mild, moderate, or heavy, was able to separate patients into risk categories on the basis of either coronary heart de uh, disease death or all-cause mortality. This makes us believe that the Gestalt method of visual analysis may be sufficient for risk classification, but not only that, once the analysis of the images were done, all five cardiothoracic radiologists were surveyed, and they all favored the purely visual subjective analysis as being easier and faster to perform than the other two. So what is the clinician's perspective on this data? Just recently, this paper was published on the interplay of physician awareness and reporting of coronary artery calcium score on chest CT. This was in the American Journal of Cardiology. And it showed that 54% of all clinicians thought that there was a relation, that it was analogous to the presence of coronary artery calcium on a calcium score. However, and interestingly, only 23% were aware that it was reported on the, on the reports from the studies. And not only that, only 4% said that they would make a clinical decision based on that finding alone. Now, the patient perspective, this table here, this is based on actual Agatstone's conventional coronary artery scoring. But we've known for a while now, patients have better adherence to lifestyle changes, either diet, exercise, use of medications, 
after having a coronary artery calcium score when compared with a control group that did not undergo calcium scoring. Even in those patients where the calcium scoring was zero, as we can see here, patients with zero on the study from RXI showed a 29% better adherence to diet, 33% to exercise, and 44% to the use of statins and aspirin than patients that didn't have a calcium scoring. Really, this should very likely translate also to the presence of calcium scoring when properly reported on a standard chest CT. Are we as cardiac imagers doing it? Are we reporting it? This is for a yet to be published uh, data that we recently acquired surveying members of the American College of Radiology that re read thoracic CT examinations. And based on the answers that we got, over 80%, close to 90% of thoracic imagers are reporting routinely the presence of or absence of coronary calcifications on their chest CT reports. However, only about half of them are reporting it with a qualitative or quantitative measure. The other half only mentioned presence or absence of calcium, and this is something that can be easily changed with some education. The last question on our survey was if these imagers were aware of the published data, which show this good correlation between calcium scores on standard Agatstone examinations and the non gated chest CTs, almost 60% of imagers were not aware of the data that we have talked about. In summary, the presence of coronary artery calcium score indicates that at least some atherosclerotic plaque is present. I think that we have shown that non gated CT assessment of coronary artery calcium score, either subjective or objective, correlates very well with traditional methods for scoring. Not only that, this knowledge may eliminate the need for additional dedicated calcium scoring CT in many patients. Thank you very much for your attention.